why don't we start by having a discussion here? Um, so the floor is open. Anyone wants to ask Ian anything? Yeah. Yeah, I thought this was a kind of win-win situation. It seems to me that you're adopting a very narrow conception of what self-interest means. Because if you go back, and this is I'm partial to the Frankfurt School, for instance. If you go back to this sort of argument that that under, especially in this phase of capitalism, even the even the 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 ruling class doesn't have a very good sort of life. Like all they're doing is consuming good, like commodity fetishism, and you can link it to sort of master slave narrative and Hegel. So it seems to me that saying that the ruling class won't essentially engage in many missions or many missions politics or, or reducing the possibility, it seems it contradicts the sort of notion that even they are damaged by capitalism. So 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 I'm not, I'm not trying to be naive, which probably sounds a bit naive that the capitalist class is going to suddenly, but it seems to me self to say that they, they will also gain something from the quality of life as opposed to the quantity of life. So, so, so that's, I don't know if this is a question, but I just want some sort of clarification on that issue. You know, if, if, it's a good point. I mean, the fact is that, that capitalist society um, narrows and distorts the humanity of every one of us, the richest and the poorest. Um, However, what it also does is it creates a powerful material interest for a very small section of the population to live with that because the other payoffs seem better. In a society that values certain things, they get what the society values more than most of us, way more than most of us. Um, they also f function, again and again, you'll run into people who say, well, yes, but we will invent a technology and that will solve it. A belief in magic. Um, <laughs> Uh, I don't know if there was a few years ago, somebody wrote a big article for the New York Review of Books that said we would invent genetically modified trees that suck more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and that would solve it, and we don't need any revolutions. Um, that belief in magic and that belief in this is the best possible society, anything else would be worse, is, a, is powerful in the overall ideology of the society, but it's extremely powerful in the layer of people who, you know, what's the latest numbers? You know, less than 1% of the population owns more wealth than 50% of the world's population. You can't actually live with that unless you believe somehow the society has, per, has that you are particularly a wonderful person and that uh, society has built a beautiful environment for you. Um, so I think it's true I can make, you know, you make the argument, this would make the world a better place for everyone. The question is, in the fight for it, the people who are really happy now about part of it are probably not going to be willing to give that up. Most of them aren't. Now, if I'm wrong, and we suddenly see, you know, Warren Buffett and all those guys joining the bar us at the barricades, wonderful. I'm all, you know, great, glad to have them, but I doubt it. On the last slide, on the bottom of the banner, there was the slogan, another world is possible. And um, at um, the social forum in Paraguay, following the Cochabamba meeting, um, a, a lot of us were going around changing that to other worlds are possible. How do you strike that kind of a balance between the fact that the world is very different places in terms of our cultural narratives and languages and the need to work together as well? That's a good, that's a very good question. The question here is, one of the problems with 20th century socialism, what it tended to be built on, the Russian Revolution is the model. And then you judged other revolutions by how far they deviated from it. Except if you look at the actual history of the 20th century, the main thing you can say is there were no two revolutions that were even slightly alike. The difference between Russia and China and Spain and Yugoslavia and Cuba and Portugal and country, countries where it succeeded and countries where it failed, all of those were very, very different experiences. And I think that's something that we are going to, that 21st century socialism must uh, build as an essential part of its, its world outlook. That is that there is not a perfect model. There may not be a model at all, but there is certainly not a perfect one. And different societies are going to find their own roots. Um, now, it's interesting, if you go back to what Marx was doing in the last decade of his life, 
was looking at societies beyond Europe and starting to talk about what alternate routes there might be. You know, but maybe Russia would achieve socialism in a different way than, than Europe, than France or England might. And uh, looking, there's a wonderful book called, uh, okay, now I've lost the name of it. Don't you hate it when you're just going to announce something? <laughs> Marx at the Margins? Yes, Kevin Anderson. Kevin Anderson's Marx at the Margins that goes into that part of Marx's work. And I think that's something that we really have to, to build on. That, uh, that we build an international movement, but it also is built on respect for an enormous level of diversity. Thanks a lot. It was, it was great to sit here and, uh, and actually hear some radical ideas uh, thrown out. Um, I, I, I guess I want to encourage us to speak a little har uh, um, more soberly about some of the challenges involved. And I, I, I think Bob, I'm not sure that uh, you caught the point that Bob was making. Maybe it raised a, a somewhat different point for me. Uh, the notion of, you know, many different worlds are possible seems to me to reflect or express the, the localism uh, in both the socialist and uh, ecological movements. Uh, uh, fear of grander narratives on both sides. Uh, a fear of large-scale organization. Uh, a reluctance to contemplate the kind of power that might be needed to dislodge uh, the powerful. I think that that Holloway's notion of taking power without taking power resonates very strongly and, and it is, a, is a powerful uh, impetus to do nothing uh, that allows us to actually confront it the challenges that we face. So there's the issue of localism, sort of like where progressive forces are at. It's not that the world doesn't just divide into progressive and non-progressive or reactionary forces. Tomorrow night I'm speaking at a meeting in, in Kempville, which is my hometown, um, about the issue of the Energy East pipeline, where the whole focus is locally concerns about our water supply, and where the committee that I'm a member of includes a couple of fundamentalist Christians, uh, some liberals, um, some old-time hippies, <laughs> and the diversity within a very local group is quite startling. Um, and yet, I think there is a sense that we're starting to build in that c community of that the you know think globally, act locally can actually be achieved. <laughs> um, it's, uh, but I, I agree with you. I think the the challenge is extraordinary. Um, that's why I tried to spend the first good part of my talk saying this is not a tri you know, what, I, what, what I'm talking about here is not trivial. Uh, many of us who got involved in the socialist movement in the 60s or 70s or through the 20th century, you know, really figured that by now, well, the, certainly the Canadian Soviet Republic would be here and we, we'd all just be sitting around doing nothing because, you know, <laughs> life would be perfect. And one thing we learned is that uh, chain, above all, change isn't linear. We go forward and we go backward. And it is a gigantic task. Um, our starting point is talking. Uh, for example, I'm not, I did not suggest here, and I wouldn't suggest, that our goal is to build some great big new eco-socialist political party. I think what we're trying to do at this point is be a um, force of ideas within a much broader left, including the people who think John Holloway got it right including the fact that among young people, anarchism is currently much stronger than socialist views are, and we have to learn how to talk to those people, just as I had to learn to talk to some fundamentalist Christians that I didn't think I could talk to. Um, and they weren't even my relatives. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you're right, I, I, I don't want to understate the problem. Um, when you look at it globally, it even gets worse um, in terms of the, po the problems, although, there are countries, especially in Latin America, where we do see mass movements building. And uh, those are things that, uh, you know, there was always the, the, the hope in the, in the uh, early Russian Revolution that revolutions in advanced countries would help out. We may be depending on revolutions in uh, third world countries to help us. Yeah, Ian mentioned the uh, Energy East uh, pipeline proposal of uh, 
Trans-Canada Pipelines, which is to take a gas pipeline that runs right across the country to Quebec and convert it to the sludge and, and uh, what they call the... Um, Diluted bitumen. Dill bit. Dill bit. Dill bit. Dill bit from the tar sands. Uh, full of chemicals and so on. Um, we're up against very powerful forces on this one, and they have arguments that we cannot avoid meeting, it seems to me. Um, I don't know whether you've been following the newspapers, but uh, the Ottawa Citizen, and I'm sure papers right across the country, carry every day, literally, huge ads from TransCanada Pipelines, mm -hmm. or Energy East, uh, promoting their thing. And there, some of those ads are quite clever, very clever, in fact, and very devious. Uh, there was one that really struck my attention the other day. It, was, it showed a, a bicycle shop, and it asked the reader to identify 10 items in the photo of, uh, that were made with oil. And it wasn't hard to find at least 10, uh, ranging from, or made using oil, ranging from the tires on the bicycle to the bicycle helmet to the uh, handlebar ends and so on and so on, and just had to go through the whole thing. And of course, it, the idea was it's indispensable, you see, and therefore we really have no choice on this. There is no alternative. But that also, of course, leads us or reminds us of our dependency on fossil fuels and the necessity to answer that point by having some sort of analysis which can offer the option of, uh, of an alternative way of organizing society because we're going to have to get off fossil fuels and as much as possible. I, I yet to see how we're going to have air transport because I can't think of how you fly airplanes or rockets for that matter, which launch those satellites that we use all the time without having some sort of fossil fuel propulsion. I'm looking forward to, um, I hope that they will find ways to do that. But anyway, that's another question. But the fact is that um, these are these are very powerful interests, and they are very effective in their propaganda, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, it's, it's impossible, therefore, to really um, address these campaigns that we are getting involved in necessarily without trying to come up with answers and that point to the possibility of organizing society in another way, fundamentally different. And so I'd just like to reinforce that point. A comment one of my friends made about that ad, by the way, was, well, that shows how stupid it is to be burning that oil. It's much too valuable. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. Uh, one question I had, you didn't talk a lot about, I mean, apart from mentioning at the end there, your engagement locally, you didn't talk a lot about the state of uh, ecological uh, or socialist organizing and organizations across the country. Uh, and I think that would be interesting to reflect on. I, I, in particular, one question I want to put in relation to this is about the one, seems to me, the, the most dynamic kind of campaign movement relating to climate change that's sweeping across North America is the student movement on campuses uh, organizing around divestment, divestment of university uh, endowment funds and pension funds and so forth. And that's, that's an issue that's of interest to me because I work on pensions. And because I, I actually think that this is, uh, unfortunately, one of those examples where an eco-socialist or, or, or a critical class-based kind of analysis uh, makes the issue look a little differently. Because uh, the thinking that, in my opinion, the thinking that a first priority would be to organize people to sell their shares, either as individual investors or you know, through pension funds, rather than dedicate energy to the, you know, the, the, the pipeline battles or the, you know, the, the urgent sort of policy battles uh, that seem to me really uh, you know, far more urgent, it seems quite important because I think, to my mind, it, it reflects the idea that we've been so neoliberalized, we've, we've so embraced the idea that, that we're just investors, and so that's our only lever in society. It seems to me part of the problem rather than part of the solution, and, and, uh, and yet I don't see a lot of the, the campaigners addressing that, and some of this came from Bill McKibben, 350.org, who's you know, campaigning around this, very, very influential uh, in, the, in the movements today. So I just, I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, let me start off with you know, 
bigger, bigger, the eco-socialist movement at this point is small. In North America, in, in Europe, there's, a, there's been some very substantial developments lately, including a, a, uh, an alliance between uh, green and left parties in about 30 countries to create an uh, eco-socialist forum, which actually has members in the European Parliament at this point. So there's uh, been some significant developments in Europe. In North America, it tends to be small. It tends to be either individuals or people from some of the existing left groups. Here in uh, Ontario, the, 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 uh, the auto eco-socialists uh, that I'm a member of um, and that organized this meeting along with Socialist Project, uh, we're brand new and you know we're a few months old and we're still at the age when we get together and discuss our colonoscopies. So uh, <laughs> the problem of building, a, you know, this is new stuff. I just scared somebody in the front row. <laughs> You're not going to put your name down, are you? I don't know that I can come and contribute to that conversation. <laughs> Learn a lot. Don't so, <laughs> no, I, I take it back. Um, that's my, po my, po my point is Ian, it's better than the alternative. It really is. Yes. Uh, my, my, my point is that this is fairly new stuff. The Rizzo Ecosystem in Quebec, which was formed about a year ago, is an interesting development, having some difficulties getting off the ground. But there are beginnings to this. Um, and a lot of it tends to be within the existing currents. There are people active in other organizations who view themselves as eco-socialists. That's really what I think we should be doing. Um, now, in terms of movements, the, the whole divestiture uh, and uh, 350.org, one of the issues, of course, for socialists is that we don't necessarily get to choose our fights. Um, if there's a movement going on, we want to be part of it if it's got any kind of seriousness. And one of the advantages of the, I mean, I agree with you, the general view that selling our shares is going to solve the problem, it obviously is not. On the other hand, it creates opportunities on campus to talk about the roles of the fossil fuel companies and to uh, explain why you shouldn't be, shouldn't, uh, why the universities should not be investing in them and so on. So it creates opportunities and openings to discuss um, that's, for example, one of the interesting things that, that Jim Hansen, uh, who, who um, the, the climate scientist who's done so much in this area, is part of what he talks about is the importance of being able just to raise the subject of the evil of the fossil fuel industry. And the, the divestiture movement gives us that opportunity. And I think we have to view it that way. And our approach to it can't be, no, come on over here and do what we're doing if they've got 500 people and we've got three. Um, the people who cross the street have, have you know, it's, it's our job to be where people are, and that is one of the places where people are. I agree with you, it's not the greatest solution in the whole world, but it's interesting how much uh, leverage, and, and uh, not leverage, that's not the word I want, um, how, how uh, much response it has been getting. That's impressive. I, part of it is precisely that we think of ourselves as investors. But part of it also is that people are starting to think about the fossil fuel industry as the problem, rather than the problem is that um, you're not riding your bicycle to work. Um, and it's, it's a step forward from, from that kind of personal, um, personal change is the way forward. I'm not saying people shouldn't ride bicycles or do through personal change, but that's not how the world will change. Absolutely. So I, I think it's got that benefit. Can I push you on this, Peter? Sorry. Could we just uh, you second off? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, <laughs> anyway, um, thanks for the presentation. Very informative. And uh, I just have a, I guess, a question and a comment. So one, the question. I, I remember being at a Canadian like Earth Congress convention in DC in the '90s and seeing um, one of the display tables a button that said, um, "I hate the environment." And and I didn't really understand that. I asked the you know, there, there was just this back then. This was you know the war of the woods in BC, and there was this like labor opposed to environmentalists, right? Um, because they were killing jobs. That was the perception. And I wonder if that um, do you see that as as a problem, or you know, like why there is that inherent um, conflict, or is there an inherent conflict, or have we moved beyond that? Um, because you know you can have a growth-based economy and a socialist economy. Too, right? You know, if, if growth is the problem, you, well, you can have a capitalist system that's growth-based or socialist, as far as I understand it. Um, and so that's that's my question. And then and then a comment, which you may want to comment on as well, is I may be cynical, but I just don't see this kind of transformation happening through a gradual sort of democratic, peaceful process. Like it seems to me that we need some kind of not we need. I don't want to put it that way, but 
it may require some kind of crisis, you know, um, like a climate, some kind of climate crisis or something that that really, you know, I don't wake, wake people up or, or whatever. That we really start to question the, the, how our system is is self destructing. Um, I don't know if you agree with that, but I know Thomas Homer Dixon has made that point before. He says, you know, we're gonna be, we have to be ready basically when when the collapse comes. If you want to put it that way, I don't, I don't know. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Let me start with your second point. Um, I think, as I said, what I think the, the system creates its own grave diggers, it also creates its own crises. Um, we don't necessarily have much control over how those will occur. So I think the, I mean, the, the key point is we have to ha start working on organizing, on building, on winning as many people as we can, on building a movement that of people who are flexible enough and open enough to see when, when opportunities occur. Um, to win people over, and whether that occurs as a result of some huge crisis or as a result of something minor, you know, it's amazing. Uh, who would have believed the uh, the Turkish Spring that took, that blew up a couple of years ago because the government wanted to build a shopping mall in a park? You know, the, the issues that can cause people to move are often not the great ones that we would imagine, um, and uh, that's important to know that we again responding to people's real concerns is very important. Now on your first question, that's a very important issue. I didn't deal with that because that's a whole talk all in itself. One of the biggest weaknesses and of the green movement in general, particularly in North America, has been it's basically an anti-labor view. You know, viewing workers who get jobs in polluting industries as the enemy, or at least treating them as the enemy, or at least not treating them as allies. And that's extraordinarily dangerous. I was actually in a meeting recently where we were talking about the, the tar sands and should we shut down the tar sands was the discussion. So we raised, okay, what would we do? <laughs> There's a lot of people working there. What are we gonna do for jobs for those people? How do we approach that? And a couple of people there, longtime green activists, basically responded as, well, they're ruining the world anyway. Who cares? Who cares? And if we, if we approach the world that way, we will lose and we will deserve to lose. We need to confront, we need to find ways to deal with what's called the just transition. That is, finding alternatives. I think the most interesting variant of this I have seen, and there are maybe many others, but the British Campaign for Climate Change has a trade union division, and which is sponsored by several of the largest unions in the country, and they have been running a campaign uh, called A Million Climate Jobs. They've just issued a new report and a new document on it. If you search for a million climate jobs on the web, you'll find it. And their point is they're not talking about little cleanup things and so on. They are talking about actually creating new work uh, and building a new kind of economy. And they've documented it, they've provided the information, and their whole point here is that we don't have to depend on dirty jobs. Um, one of the things that, that I've talked about in other in articles I've written is, for example, one of the first th first things that we should offer all you know as we start as we phase out the tar sands is that the workers working there should have the opportunity to work on cleaning it up. <laughs> There's a whole lot of stuff to be cleaned up there, and it's going to take a long time. Those are big and important and skilled jobs. In addition, as we phase out um, uh, as we phase out fossil fuels, we're going to deal things like retrofitting homes to improve uh, energy efficiency. There's a host of things that need to be done. Um, but if we approach it as it's solely a th object of shutting things down without, and I know guys from my town who go, go to Fort McMurray every year, work for eight months, and then come back for a couple. And these are guys who couldn't have afforded a house if they hadn't done that. That there's certainly no jobs in our town. Um, and if we treat them as the enemy, we lose. They are our allies and must be seen as our allies. Because they understand that environment. We're gonna clean it up. We need people to understand it. That was a, that was a fabulous answer, Peter. Uh, and I think it speaks to, to the issue that I was raising about localism. I mean, these are clearly large scale projects. But the, the issue that I wanted to raise that goes back to the, uh, to the divestment campaign. And it, as I, I'm just trying to push you, because I, I think that the strategic challenges are are really serious. Doesn't, and put as a question, isn't one of the problems 
with the divestment strategy that it suggests that the problem is not systemic, but just sit home. Right? And, and, and if the, life is difficult for us because, with, especially when people who are allies are focused on sectoral strategies <laughs> and not systemic ones. Uh, and if you wind up going where they are, if you just wind up going where they are, how do you then raise the broader issue? Or how do you act without reinforcing the idea that it might just be a sectoral problem and not a systemic one? I don't have an answer. I, mean, I, I don't have perfect <laughs> answers either. But, you know, I do recall, you know, the people of my generation say, well, I remember when we built the anti-war movement. We always do that, don't we? <laughs> um, but the fact is that the socialists in that movement managed to campaign specifically on that subject while si simultaneously talking to people about socialism and what the problem was, what imperialism was, and so on. Um, you know, I kept running into people saying, all you're saying is bring the troops home, that's not a radical demand. Well, it was a very radical demand as far as the Vietnamese were concerned. Um, but we also used the opportunity to talk about other ideas. And I th that's part of what I think eco-socialists need to do. When, when I run to do a talk called Why Greens Must Be Red and Reds Must Be Green, I mean, I don't know to what extent in this audience uh, uh, there's anybody here who hadn't thought of socialism as a solution before, but at least hope somebody who saw the poster thought that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, you need to do more, and we need to find ways to do it. Um, I will not suggest that I know what they all are. And I suspect it'll be different in different contexts. You know, what works in one place won't work in another. So a lot of it is going to be learning. Uh, as I say, I mean, I keep coming back to my own experience. I really did have to learn to talk to people who think the world is 6,000 years old. <laughs> Hi, I'm, my name's Tim Martin. Um, and I'm really pleased to uh, see that there's now an Ottawa eco-socialist group, and I've uh, put my name on the list. Um, and they refuse to talk about my colonoscopies. You won't get I work in uh, physical science in, in modeling uh, environmental systems and such, agriculture. And uh, I work with a lot of economists. And um, I was going to say, in, in uh, using mathematical models, I, I you know, really, really find that a powerful tool. And of course, economists have uh, mathematical models that they use, and I find it very difficult to, you know, many of these economists are um, are green, you know, they're, they're environmentalists, and they um, are hoping to be able to build a, a sustainable uh, capitalist system, and they use their models to uh, talk about that. What I want to ask is, what, what I would really like to be able to do, I mean, it must be possible to mathematically, using economists' mathematical models, demonstrate that capitalism is unsustainable and cannot be tweaked into being sustainable. Unfortunately, I haven't found any economists. So do you have any recommendations on Who's working on this? Who should I be reading? Who should I be working with? There are, there are a number, first of all, there are a number of economists who are working on this kind of question, Marxist economists and, and the whole area of, of sort of the, non, the uh, what did they call it, non-autistic economists? <laughs> they, they, that, there was actually a campaign for non-autistic econ economics in France uh, run by students who hated the professors. To, to uh, but the, the, point, the point is, what they were talking about was trying to get things that related to what they were actually seeing in the world as opposed to abstract models. Paul Burkett, whose work Marks and Nature I mentioned, okay. he's also published a book, and I wonder if they've got the name of it on here. Yes, it's called Marxism and Ecological Economics. Okay. And it's a series of essays in which he tries to show, and he tries to be in a friendly way, show how Marxism can illuminate the problems of, eco of, of, of mainstream ecological economics. Uh, now, I am not an economist. You know, I got as far, I got about 10 pages into the Samuelson book and decided this didn't make any sense, so I stopped studying. Um, but the book struck me, uh, Paul Burkett's book struck me as very, very good. He's uh, an interesting writer. 
Um, I mentioned two books, by the way, I and mean, just to go at these, if you want to get a sense of Marxism and, and ecology, uh, John Bellamy Foster's Marxist Ecology, Marxist Ecology, uh, which is basically, these are not beginner books, these are difficult books, I'll tell you. Uh, but this is, goes at Marx as, in terms of philosophy, and Paul Briquette's Marx and Nature, which goes at it from the point of view of political economy, arguing that, Mar that there's a fundamental ecological basis to Marxism. Um, Foster's book is better known. Paul, Paul Briquette had the disadvantage of publishing with a publisher who put it out in an extremely expensive hardback and then refused to put out a paperback edition for a decade. Uh, but it came out in paperback this year, uh, and it's worth reading. Uh, it's, uh, it's, um, Haymarket has published it. So, Marx and Nature by Paul Briquette, and al almost anything written by John Bellamy Foster. Thanks. Yeah. Perhaps an answer to that is that the uh, rate of, that we're using the world's resources just cannot be sustained under any system, capitalist or other. Yeah. He burnt up 300 million years of photosynthesis in 250 years. Mm -hmm. One of the difficulties with mathematical modeling, as powerful as it is, is that, of course, ultimately your assumptions determine what comes out the far end. Exactly. Yeah, and the, exactly. the refusal to question the assumptions has always been the big problem exactly. with, with, with mainstream okay. economic, economic yeah. theory. Yeah, and I've certainly read enough to get that deep into it. <laughs> uh, I need someone who's you know, I mean, let's, let's model better assumptions. You know, there's... Sure. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, Nick's math is what came to my mind right away when, when you asked that question. And one of the reasons why it has, I, among other things, I looked on uh, the Eco-Socialist website last night, and I watched um, a talk by Dr. Jeremy um, Jackson, the... Uh, um, the uh, marine ecologist talk about the state of the world's oceans and I was drawn to it right away because about a year ago I saw that new film out by the uh, young Canadian guy called Revolution which you may have seen where he talks about the state of the oceans. Uh, it's a number of eco-scientists that make the claim in that film as did Jeremy Jackson uh, more or less um, that we've got about 20 years to turn this around to save the world's oceans because of mass extinctions. Uh, and if we're not talking about the oceans, we're talking about forests, we're talking about uh, species and habitat destruction that's going on now at a rate that's um, tragic, I guess is um, about all you could say about it. So I guess the question is, I, I guess I'm happy to see you folks in the room tonight talking about this, trying to encourage some kind of movement because I think it's a fair question to ask, do we have time? Either we do or we don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the question, wh whether we do or we don't, you do what you can. You know, it's, uh, mm -hmm. it was a Gramsci uh, uh, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will uh, is my attitude to life. But I think the point is, one of the difficulties with these, the dates and deadlines that get set is they are not absolutes. Uh, the world is, I mean, two, two centuries from now, if nothing changes, we're in deep doo-doo, possibly gone. 20 years from now, no, we're not. But we might be in much worse conditions than we are. Um, and somewhere in between are our targets. And, you know, I, I, I have, I, I remember reading somewhere that Lenin about 1915 said, well, I won't live to see the revolution. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but it's a neat story anyway. The uh, point is that change does take place in surprising ways, uh, and we, you have to do what you can. I, I do. If, the temperature, if the average temperature goes over two degrees, it's going to create great difficulties. If it goes over four degrees, it's going to create even worse difficulties. That won't stop us from fighting for a better world. Well, to add to the pessimism of the last comment uh, and your observa the observations that have been made about the assumptions that go into the models, I've yet to read about a model, and I'm not an economist, nor do I aspire at the age of 80 to become one. Um, I don't see any of the literature for lay readers who are green uh, socialists on the um, 
uh, even an estimate of the amount of methane that is being released and it will continue to be released now that it started since it is a positive feedback loop. Uh, 20 years we may have, um, but I, I don't know, I don't believe any of the models, including the ones come out of, coming out of the uh, climate scientist, uh, 98 of them, who, or 99 of them, who have brought out this last uh, summarization of uh, the data. Um, but we do have to uh, do something. I, I don't want to leave my four grandchildren and who have so far desisted from procreating, so we have any great grandchildren. But I, I want to leave this earth uh, with a relatively clean conscience about what I've done, tried to do to turn it around. And eco-socialism is in, as I understand it, as I would try to apply it, is the only avenue available to us to have an impact. But I'm very pessimistic because of the uh, things like the Koch brothers plowing millions of dollars into buying votes in the U.S. and the Supreme Court saying that corporations are persons and they can't, their freedom of speech cannot be limited and on and on and on. And we're importing that philosophy into Canada. It just seems like a, a humongously overwhelming uh, struggle. Uh, I'm sorry to be a wet blanket. But well, I started off by saying it's a big struggle and I, in the talk, and I agree that it is. Um, no one's, one of the difficulties I have often found in talking to socialists is a tendency to understate it um, and to treat it as just, you know, just another line item in the program. And it's not. And I don't, it, it wasn't for Marx either. But there's been a period when we've sort of when socialists tended to view it that way. Um, As I said, uh, well, like quoting uh, Eric Olin Wright in my talk, even if we get rid of capitalism, we haven't got a guaranteed victory. That's right. Um, that's the beginning. That gets us to the beginning point. So the fight to get to the beginning point is what we're holding meetings like this about. Come at the back room. Yeah, sort of. Just sort of maybe thinking about it, the fact that one of the things the environmental movement I think is, does a lot of is you know, catastrophism. Like you're talking about, like 20 years, you know, oh my God, sort of all gone, and I think that's very demobilizing for people. Like, how do you, like, in, in the context of unless we radically change everything, then 20 years, then we're doomed. You know, a lot of people are going to say, okay, fine, well then, you know, yeah, like, I stay home, watch some TV, right? Um, and the other side, and then you have like, in, like there are some of the radical environments who, again, it's like, we, you know, nothing's good enough, that it's all out revolution. You know, like unless we're all out in barricades, moral, and it's pointless. And I think one of the things as socialists, we have to figure out how to both respect the magnitude of the problem, come up with realistic, real, you know, winnable reforms that move us towards what we're working for. And I think that's actually a real challenge. Like I think, you know, because they say like most environmentalists, like you, you listen to them and it's like, you know, like even I, who really, you know, still like a very pious guy in many ways still, you know, after a while it's like, oh, this is terrible, you know, like, what do we do now? Like, uh, I'm pretty home and cry, there's some wine, you know? <laughs> I live 30 feet from a railway track and I watch bitumen go by all day. Yeah. Um, well, some people here know that I've been engaged in a couple of big debates about catastrophism as a subject, um, and I, am in, I have been inclined to say it's not as big as, you know, in the radical left, it's not as big an issue as, as, as often been portrayed, and I still think that's true. But it is interesting, and this is something that's become more apparent to me in the last few months, the extent to which catastrophism is a dominant viewpoint among liberals. Um, so it, it doesn't come from radicals saying, if we only tell people they've only got 20 years, that'll cause them to revolt. What it does do, what it does come from, is liberal NGOs saying, if we tell them they've only got 20 years, maybe they'll pay, send us a check. Um, and I've been getting a lot of direct mail of late, yeah. which has that tone. And it's, uh, I mean, I presume 
that they have done the testing that direct mail people do, and it has worked for them so far, but I'm kind of inclined to agree that their funds may dry up if that's continued. Um, on the other hand, of course, there is the famous, all the famous experiments of people who predict the world is going to end, and then when it doesn't, they just keep going and just move the prediction forward. But, um, yeah, I think there, we need, we need to be accurate about describing the problem as, as precise and as scientific as we can be. In my view, the IPCC reports, although they are on the conservative side, they, I mean, in the sense of, I think they understate the problem, they provide us with a solid framework that it's very hard to, dis, to argue against. And it gives us a set of, of scientifically based arguments that we can, be, we can begin from, and I think that's important for us to do. On the other hand, the weakest part of the new IPCC reports is the last one, which is on solutions, because it's basically just a list of every solution you ever heard of, you know, store, carbon storage, or carbon taxes, big, there's really nothing in it. Um, we need, and Richard, I think, made a good point early on, we need hope. We need more messages that are hopeful and more messages that say, this is how we could actually deal with this. Uh, I just got a book that, that uh, came from England, and I have no idea where it, whether it's very good or not. Um, watch Climate and Capitalism, I'll probably review it, but it came from a socialist in England who has written a book in which the first half is how to move to um, uh, non-fossil fuel energies, and the second half is how socialism could do that. Um, now, I don't know whether it's a good book or not. I bought it on the basis of a three-sentence description. But we need more of that. We need uh, more of explaining, as you say, concrete. These are real things that can be achieved. That's one of the things I like about the, the British Million Climate Jobs Plan. The million is obviously a, a nice round number, but they've got solid numbers and figures and well-backed-up research to go with it. Uh, we could really use something like that in this country. The Green Economy Network is doing a similar, starting a similar campaign. That's right. And that, that kind of stuff is very important to do. Yeah, I was just going to add about the oceans. Uh, I was in Newfoundland, northern Newfoundland, in the 60s, uh, listening to the fishermen saying, there's a problem. They're not there like they used to be. And it took 30 years before. And this was being observed by the scientists. And 30 years later, they were declared empty. And of course, the irony is, those people for work went out to work in Alberta. So I see it as important for this kind of group to, to put a Canadian face on the reality of what we're into. They're out there now working on a non-renewable resource with the same fate is what they left in the East Coast. Um, okay. Thanks. Um, oh, thinking about the uh, the pessimism, I tend to be a pessimist too. Um, but I think they, they I, I have kind of a, a black optimism or a negative optimism in that I think capitalism is likely to collapse significantly globally now that it is a single global capitalism um, you know well within our 20 year time limit in a way because the, the issue really is how do we get mass mobilization well we need mass dissatisfaction and the environmental crisis is something you don't no is a problem until it's too late. You don't become dissatisfied until it's too late. But uh, an economic collapse, you know, based on Marx's analysis uh, 200 years ago, is, or 150 years ago, it, I, I think is just as likely to happen within the next 20 years as the, the uh, environmental collapse. So I think we, we uh, you know, there's there's hope in the good old traditional socialist analysis. How can you describe yourself as a pessimist? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you should think of yourself as a pessimist, given that 
We just went through a very deep financial crisis, and what we got is uh, a Republican administration in the United States. I, it, it's, it's far from obvious that, uh, besides the fact it's far from obvious that capitalism is going to collapse like that, it's far from obvious that that will be good. Thank you. Yeah, no, I agree 100% that there's nothing to say it will be good. Um, I don't think the, the crisis we just went through was huge. Uh, because, you know, we didn't, nobody worked. Well, we, we, um, <laughs> we used socialism for the rich to keep yeah. it from. I tend, to, I tend to the view that it's not, you know, capitalism isn't going to fall, it's going to need a pretty big push. Um, the uh, years ago, I think it was in the first week or two after I launched Climate Capitalism, uh, somebody uh, wrote in the comments discussion, we got into a comments thing, and somebody was saying, well, do you think capitalism can solve the climate crisis? And gave some reasons. And the reply that another reader used, I have quoted many, many times. And he wrote, yes, capitalism will come up with a solution to this, but you're really going to hate it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think that's something we're going to have to confront, is that the capitalist solutions, I mean, if you start thinking in terms of, you know, we're, all, we're building walls around countries already, or they are. You started getting into gated communities gated countries, uh, when guys like Lovelock can suggest that Britain should basically just invest all its money in a navy to keep refugees out, um, it's just, you start to get into a, an idea of a, well, I said, we, we say, you know, eco-socialism or barbarism, taking the slogan from from, um, from Rosa Luxemburg and, and so on, but at the very least, you're starting to think in terms of a climate feudalism. <coughs> of, uh, build walls and tiny fractions of the population being saved. Those are all very scary futures. Um, I guess a, a good part of me just says, that's so scary that I'm not willing to give it, it, give it you know, to, to let it happen without me fighting back. And that's, I think, I think our chances are better than most. I think our chances are not bad, but I would not suggest it's trivial or that we yet know exactly how we should be doing it. I think a lot of our, one of the things I think the eco-socialist movement should be doing is experimenting, is finding out what kinds of things work, what kinds of movements work, how we can work well in certain contexts and not in other contexts, and being extraordinarily open to things that those of us who came up through the socialist movement would historically have said, oh, you can't do that, that does not fit our model. Well, um, our model didn't work. <laughs> so let's uh, start being a lot more open, in fact, I think a lot of people are, to more to new and different approaches. Um, would would any of um, us old-time socialists have ever imagined Occupy Wall Street? Um, no, we would not have. Now that did not carry through, but it was a very interesting example of a different approach to doing things that we might want to not exclude. I was wondering if anyone is aware of. Professor John McMurtry's uh, work from Guelph. His book, which I'm reading now, is The Cancer Phase of Capitalism. And it, it ties, it's a beautiful analogy of to, to link the ecological and the economic. An economic system which is full of growth the way a cancer is, by ignoring what's happening to the environment, it will kill the host. So, Why don't we, uh, any more questions? Well, look, um, that was a great discussion, really great questions, and it's great to see an audience of people who are clearly involved in a variety of things here. Um, so I just would like to say again that in two weeks' time, we'll be meeting in the same time, same space here, um, and we would like to talk about you know, how we could do eco-socialist work uh, together and what kinds of projects might be worth considering. Um, so there's a number of, uh, I, I think we've got a lot about how on the table here, but we need to keep talking about that. Clearly, um, 
the trade union movement cannot be the enemy, right? <laughs> say things like this, right? But how to work inside of movements in which we're minorities and, and not, and to do that in good faith, I think is a certain kind of thing we'll need to discuss. What kinds, you know, many people here I know are involved in um, anti-pipeline activism, uh, things like that. A, a lot of people would like to see free tr public transport movements um, starting up. And there's many, many things that we could consider and many, many ways of working. And I can see there's a lot of people who are thinking about this quite seriously already. So please sign up um, and please come back in two weeks to this same time, same place. And uh, we can continue this talk in a more activist vein, right? Uh, it's great to um, share ideas and to uh, exchange ideas and educate ourselves. But this is a constant part of the work I think we have to do. But we also, as I think was very well put today, we have to be involved in struggles. And that is how we will come up with good ideas. And that's how we will change ourselves and ultimately find the kinds of organizing that are adequate to the challenges that we face. So um, please come back. Uh, that was a very good discussion. I think there's a basis to keep talking, doing things together here. So sign up and uh, thanks for coming.